And thank you for joining us this evening, both here on the webinar and on YouTube. My name is Nathan Winkelstein. I'm the Associate Artistic Director of Red Bull Theatre, and I am your host this evening. Um, this is a bowl session for The Courage to Right a Woman's Wrongs, the reading we did this Monday in association with the Diversifying the Classics initiative out of UCLA. UCLA, the Diversifying the Classics initiative did this reading as part of the La Escena Festival. A number of the other projects that they did are still available on the website, which you will see in the chat momentarily, until December 1st. So if you enjoyed Courage, which I'm assuming if you're here you did, please do uh, try to check all of that out. Just a few uh, housekeeping things in terms of how this evening is going to work. Some of you I see have already figured it out. This is of course a Q&A, so if you look along the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A button. You can write any questions you have there. If you are interested in asking the questions yourself with your own voice, you can also click the little hand raise button. And if I see that the question has a hand raise associated with it, then I will uh, unmute you and you'll be able to ask the question yourself. It does not affect whether or not your question gets chosen, so it is absolutely fine if you don't wish to. It is just there for your convenience. For those of you who haven't, for some reason, watched Courage to Right a Woman's Wrong, you're going to have a very interesting evening tonight, but you still do actually have a little bit of time to watch it. You have until tomorrow at 7 p.m. to watch it or to tell your friends who haven't watched it to watch it, and then it disappears for forever. So please do check it out or get your friends to check it out. Great, that's enough from me. I'm now going to introduce our first couple of guests this evening. These are two scholars from the Diversifying the Classics initiative, and they are two of the many scholars directly responsible for translating the this version of the play that you saw on Monday. They are Barbara Fuchs and Robin Kello. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Robin. Hello. How are you? Great, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Oh, well, it's such a pleasure to have you, and it was such a pleasure to get to present this incredible translation you both did. What an accomplishment. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Mm -hmm. um, can I, let's start with the most generic question in the world, but I think is one that's pertinent here. Could you, Barbara, maybe just give us a little bit of a background about this play and this playwright, which, of course, for many um, English, much of the English speaking audience, we don't know much about. Yeah, so um, we were we were thrilled to be able to do a translation of Ana Caro. We don't um, know a lot about her. Um, we were, of course, um, fascinated to be translating a play by a female author. We think that's one of the things that the Hispanic classical tradition can really bring to the table. She's one of several female playwrights writing uh, and writing for the commercial theater in the period. Um, and Anacato's case is especially interesting because we do know that um, she was uh, born uh, as an enslaved person and was then adopted uh, by an officer of the high court in Granada. Um, and so it's almost mind boggling to imagine that life, right? A life that led to being um, a successful writer. She is praised by several poets in the period. Um, so I think the way in which her just her figure expands our sense of what early modern authorship might look like, right? And that world of the theater might look like um, and just how inclusive it might be in a way that I think modern audiences might find surprising is very interesting. And then this play um, is I think of particular interest because um, I think there's, we, we pointed some of this out in the program notes as well, it shows just how familiar Anacaro is with the tradition, right? By the time she's writing, there are hundreds of plays uh, in circulation and in, the, in popular memory. Um, and one of the things she does that um, is so interesting is channel different writers. So if you remember um, the very brooding scene at the beginning uh, to people who know Calderon is very Calderonian, the way in which she is explicitly writing a play that pushes back on the Don Juan story of, you know, sequential abandonment of women by a cad uh, to, to write the version that one of those women might write if she had agency. Um, 
is very interesting. And there are several other moments in the play where she seems to really be channeling uh, different playwrights of the moment. And so the, the sense of her facility with that entire culture and of this being a, a play that shows that off, I think is particularly exciting. Yeah, it was, I, I mean, I was going to ask and then we will mo we'll move forward, but I did want to ask about the Don Juan thing really quickly. Is this, I had never heard of a play or even a, a trope of Don Juan getting, getting his back, you know, like, is this pretty unique to this script or was that something that had happened before in the in in the culture or was this really her invention creating that that idea? Well, so and I'll just say a little bit about this. I mean, in in Tirso's version of the Don Juan story, um, generally translated as the trickster of Seville, um, I mean, he does descend to the underworld. So if you count that, he does he does get his comeuppance in that world. Uh, but but in terms of in terms of um, one of his conquests, uh, sort of taking her her revenge or making him, you know, do the right thing, um, I think that is a that is a particularly feminist, dare we say, perspective that Anacato is putting forward uh, in this text and is part of its interest. Yeah. Wonderful, um, Robin. Could you tell us a little bit about what went into this translation that you and I, I'm not, how, there was like 14 or 15 of you who worked together on creating this translation. What what was that process like? How And what was the inspiration for it? So sure, this is a, a, something we've been doing for, I, guess, I suppose six or seven years now. So we have five plays, Barbara, is it? Um, and more and more in the pipeline to come. And uh, and what and the way that it works is again when when we're lucky enough to have a play such as this one that's just so rich and has so much going on, um, then then we take it to the table and we and we we break it into sections and we do it collectively. So depending on the given play, we might have you know three or four core people and some people who jump in when they can, or we might have you know 10, 15 people really working on that translation. Um, and and our theory of translation, such as it is, is we're trying to we're trying to put text out there that'll work in performance. Right, so it's just beautiful to hear the language in 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 the mouths of your wonderful actors, and seeing how the kind of range that we're going for to do justice to Leonor's intelligence, to do justice to the sort of arrogance and sleaziness of Don Juan, to do justice to to the um, to the humor of of the graciosos in this play. We're trying to cover that range in a, in a modern idiom that that doesn't sound like we're trying to you know imitate Shakespeare, but at the same time maybe a, a bit more of a formal register um, than. You, you might see on television. That's what we're really going for is what will work on stage. And, and so it was a delight to be able to, to see that happen in real time on, on Sunday evening, Monday evening. Yes, even though it wasn't on stage, it still uh, somehow managed to work even on this, even on this format in some ways, particularly on this format, which was great. Um, I think we actually, one of the questions that has already come through from the audience, I think may be most specifically of, of interest to the two of you. So before we introduce some of the actors, I'd actually love, and I actually think this person has raised their hand. Hi, Amelia. Um, everybody, let me introduce, of course, one of the guests of honor tonight. This is uh, Amelia Ben Susan, uh, not Jim Bredesen. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Jim, for saving me, though, and sending me a link. I, I was linkless at this moment. So, yeah, And believe it or not, this is the person who helped us through the technical phenomenon <laughs> of putting on this play. Um, yeah. So uh, we've just heard a little bit about the history of both this play and the translation, and I would love to just throw you right in because I know you've only got a limited time because we're all busy and you're teaching and everything else. And I was wondering, so you've been with this project for a little history for this project, for those of you who were watching, this was the reading that we were planning on doing a week, less than a week after everything shut down. Right. We so, were like one of the first things to, I, I feel like our decision to cancel um, was, you know, one of the great indicators of how bad it was going to be. <laughs> yep. Yeah, before we all really understood. And so, but that means that this play was in um, your mind for a long time. And it, it was, of course, in your mind originally for a stage, but then we were so fortunate right. to be able to do it online. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about 
when you first read this play and why it excited you and why it continues, because I know it has, because I was in the rehearsal process with you, why it continues right. to excite you as a from a director perspective and a dramatic perspective. Um, yeah, of course. I was um, I had such a good time when I first read it because it plays with so many of the conventions that we um, accept and understand and kind of welcome from what we think of it as a uh, solely Elizabethan theater, right? For those of, for, for folks who aren't aware of the Spanish golden age, I mean, there's so many parallels to the vocabulary of the Elizabethan work. So um, I love that it had um, the familiarity of those tropes while turning them, while playing with convention. Um, I am a big, I'm also a big fan of Lope de Vega and Calderón de la Barca, perdón. Um, and so discovering Ana Caro, who I did not know before this, was, was a kick because I, I felt really lucky that I got her allusions, understood her references, but also just really welcomed the theatrical imagination. Um, as I said to the actors on the first rehearsal, there's a spirit of improvisation to this play. Every character is presentational within the society in a way that's just so much fun to play with theatrically. Um, and there's a self-awareness and an irony that's alive in the play at all times, which just makes it, and I, I see, you know, we're going to have some of our actors speaking. We had an incredibly intelligent cast for this. You. You know, there's really no such thing as a good actor who's not a smart actor. That's one of the misnomers in our society is underestimating and undervaluing um, actors' insights. I feel like this play really calls for a sophisticated performance that can play with layers of meaning of a, I know the role I'm playing, I understand the trope, that I am sending up, and I also know where there's a genuine connection in this moment. I just loved it, and I, I feel like it has so much potential to be alive on stage. And uh, kudos, Robin, Barbara, and your entire team. I mean, I just, as a translator myself, I just really, really admired uh, how dynamic and alive the language was. So let me ask a couple of questions real quick off of here that are very much, I think, good for this group. And then we're going to invite the audience on. Uh, Peter, I, I know I sort of, I, I, I hinted at Peter and then, and then Amelia stole the show. Uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry, so, Peter. <laughs> so Peter, I'm going to uh, quote unquote, allow you to talk. Uh, thanks, Zoom. And you can uh, ask your question, which I, I think is a fascinating one. So this is, uh, I'm not going to try your last name. This is Peter. Hi, it's Peter Tedeschi, actually. Can you hear me okay? Good. Yes. So I'm an actor based in New York, but I actually um, went to the University of Madrid. I majored in Spanish lit at the University of Madrid, and my, my ancestry is Spanish. And um, so this, I, I was in heaven. It was so beautifully translated. I'd never heard it in English before, and it was just wonderful, so thank you. But also, in Golden Age lit, of course, it's always about honor. It's always about honor. Lope de Vega focuses on it. Calderon focuses on it. But we have el honor y la honra. And in English, they're always both translated as honor. So I'm wondering how you dealt with the subtleties with that, how you communicated that with the actors. And also, you know, honra, to oversimplify, is a little more personal, maybe. But, you know, you, I always heard the male perspective of that, Lope's perspective or Cervantes' perspective of that. So did a, did a woman playwright in the original language bring a, a new layer to that? Thank you. That's uh, those are really those are really great um, linked questions. I mean, without the Spanish text in front of me now, I'm not recalling specific moments of of the decision, the choice to make between those terms. I will say that um, that certainly things look very different from a woman's perspective, um, and that one of the things that we that we find often in these plays, and we have been we have been deliberately choosing plays that complicate a little bit that sense that you have that you know Spanish plays are all about honor. Um, because we find that very often, going back to what Emilio was saying, everyone in this world understands that honor is a performance, right? And so that as long as you can 
perform honor, you can figure out ways to do what you want. Um, and one really great example of this is uh, Lopez play The Widow of Valencia, mm -hmm. in which this woman, you know, uh, announces very loudly that she will not remarry because she's very pious. Also, she wants to control her own life. Um, but then, you know, when she wants a guy that she sees in the marketplace, she has him brought to her house with a hood over his head so he doesn't know where he is and he can't give her away. Um, so, you know, that is just one particularly scandalous example. But there are a lot of these plays in which um, everyone, everyone in this world understands the importance of appearances and everyone knows how to get around them. Um, and I think the, the, the sense of playfulness, again, to go back to what Mele was saying in, in the Anacado, where um, it's not entirely clear which path Leonor is going to take. You know, she seems, she seems really like she might kill him at some points, in which case there's no honor. Um, and of course, to modern audiences, the idea that she would want him back is complicated, right? But she's trying to, to repair um, this harm that has been done. Um, I think there's, there's definitely that sense that her, um, her ambivalence, right, complicates um, that simple equation of, well, as long as you marry me, it's all solved, right? There's been space in the play for contemplating other possibilities. Thank you. Thank, and thank you, Peter. Um, I think that now is a good time to introduce the rest of our guests, many of our actors from the show. Um, I'm going to read them off as I see them on my list. So that's Alfredo Narciso. Oh, this is going to be fun. Uh, Anita Castilla Halverson, Anthony Michael Martinez, Helen Cespedes, Natasha Diaz, and that's all of them. Um, so thank you all so much for joining with this post-show discussion. And thank you uh, also for your wonderful work on Monday and for all of your work throughout rehearsal. We'll give the, the audiences being slightly shy at this point in terms of questions for the audience, uh, for the actors. But I would love to start because I do think that there remains quite a bit of curiosity uh, amongst the lay people um, of how it is for an actor to to do this work in this way on Zoom. And, and specifically, something that I got a lot of, because, uh, of course, you all performed into a void, and then they all tell us how well you did, and then we don't pass it on because we have stuff to do. Um, but I can pass on to you now that one of the major things that happened with this reading was a lot of people were really talking about the ownership that the uh, that the actors had over both the language they were saying, but also over their, their use of the camera and their use of the space. So let me toss this... Uh, uh, let's start with Helen, actually, if you don't mind. And could you tell me a little bit about like how it's been uh, trying to present a play like this in this format? Uh, sure, I can try. Hi. Um, first of all, I'll say uh, such a wonderful group of actors. I feel like um, at the end of our rehearsal, the first day of rehearsal, I was sort of like beaming with like, ah, oh, it's so fun. And then the end of our second day of rehearsal, I felt so sad because I felt that gap. It was like, I felt the gap between Zoom acting and the live experience. Um, but I just want to say that, like, I feel any, I feel that sense of ownership that I'm so glad to hear was communicated over both the language and the medium. Like, I feel like I want to express gratitude to the way Melia ran the room and um, the sort of permission she gave us that that I feel like she really led with that um, sense of like, look, let's not pretend we're not trapped in these like boxes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's hard, you know, because I feel like one of the things I love about live theater and hopefully we'll have everyone rushing to back to live theater when there's a vaccine is it's like we get a break from these screens and we get to move molecules in between each other as actors and with the audience and um nothing makes me crave that more than when I'm aware of like oh something's missing here oh right I have to look at my script on one side of my screen and even though I might have like the beautiful face of my fellow actor in front of me I actually can't engage with it that much or get all of that feedback and information that would 
I like to think, um, give a, a performance that's very much in response and in the moment as opposed to sort of semi-manufactured in an idea land. Um, that said, I feel like uh, it's such a joy to get to play and to get to play with this amazing text that I was not aware of at all. I mean, that just is such a gift. It's like, I miss live theater, but I'm glad that we can do this in the meantime. I, I do have to just do a shout out to this cast because you can't even say, you know, even just, and I, I think I'm frozen. I'm having nope. so many tech difficulties tonight. I We've apologize. got your audio though. Your audio All right. is coming I, I will, I will, I will just finish by saying that they can't even um, look at each other and know where the other person is because of the translation from Zoom to the to the format we're using online so that actors end up with post-its saying where to look in each scene. I mean, it really speaks to how gifted you all are and the rest of our cast was how able they were to transcend that. Um, let me ask, let me jump in real quick here because I, I, I think our disembodied voice of our director, we may, oh, the person I was, the question I was gonna ask went away. Uh, I, I remember some of it. Um, somebody asked a question and then I guess got shy about it, but I actually liked the question a lot. Uh, somebody asked a question about how it was for you, Alfredo, and also for Amelia, dealing with the, uh, the leading male role in this play being both fundamentally unlikable in terms of his previous actions, but also having to be something like, but also the audience is supposed to like him. So how you and they they were also complimentary of you of you landing that balance and how how did you handle that um, natural antithesis or whatever the word is I'm looking for? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I wish I had an answer for it. Um, uh, my answer is we cast Alfredo Narciso. Yeah, so that, 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 that's you my are answer. Too or, you kind, know. Too well, you know, one thing we talked about before is we talked about sort of those Comedia uh, stock characters a little bit. And, and, and I do see, you know, um, Don Juan as a, a little bit. He's both the lover, but he's also the, the captain, you know, the braggart a little bit. And so I think it's always just trying to find the most human way in to uh, a, a character to, to find... Um, their flaws are the things that actually make them the most human. And, you know, I think the, the, the word fickle keeps coming up in the script. And, and when, when Leonor keeps calling him fickle over and over again, how upsetting that, that gets to him after a while to be considered that when you are dealing a play with, with honor and your word and all of that, and the idea of fickleness was, was something that I, I really um, latched onto in the performance of it. Um, that was that was fun to play, and I think that that sort of helped to like ground it in sort of that that flaw that he sort of has that he he's coming to terms with. Um, so maybe that might be part of a way to <laughs> answer that question. I don't know. I think that's right. It's part of the self mocking the script does. Um, it gives you so much freedom. I mean, I could really imagine a full production where it would become more and more anachronistic in some ways. Mm. Um, uh, sorry, all. I apologize for the bad connection. The audio is still just brilliant. Okay. So just yeah. saying that it's a great portrait of you. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to hear about how I look frozen. Um, <laughs> really, life is hard enough on Zoom, and then that happens. You know, whoever takes a screen capture is dead to me. But um, um, I think, I mean, there's so much room to like these people as actors. It gives yeah. you that freedom. I mean, I know, Alfredo, you and I joked about your first entrance and how you really had to fill the screen. Um, that, that it's a star turn when you come on, because even though you don't tell us you're Don Juan, we're gonna learn you're Don Juan soon enough. And there's expectations around that. It, it gives you a lot of room to giggle, that kind of thing, it makes everybody likable. Yeah, and I, I'll also say too, the asides, there, there's so many asides in the play and they're so great. And I, it gives the actors the opportunity to 
show what they're really thinking and how they're really feeling as opposed to this uh, performance that they're putting on for society and for the other characters within the play. And so I think that that helps to like humanize as well. And real quickly to talk about the first question you'd asked that Helen so beautifully answered, I'd say the other thing about performing for Zoom is we have to calibrate our performances a little bit because it is more cinematic in that way. It's more film and TV. But the thing that Melia was also saying too is that we have to preserve the idea that this is theater as well. And so her idea of me coming out and having that quote unquote star entrance as, as, she, as she put it was, is important to like make sure that we understand that we are doing a play right. and that it, it exists in that space and that our imaginations can, can take us to that place as well. But I think it's also, and I've been watching this space since Red Bull started doing these in March, was it? Or very early April. Um, I think it's really interesting also how audiences are learning this mode as well, right? So this, you know, I'm not sure who first did the aside like this, but the, the way that is now a legible convention, like we understand what you're doing and it works really well. And so when the asides occur like that, you know, the, the audience gets it. And so it might not be the same as when we're seeing you do it on a stage and just look to the side, but we understand exactly what's going on. And so I think there's a, with all the frustrations of Zoom, I think we are all learning how to watch theater on Zoom. And, and that also, you know, helps the, helps it a lot. It's a little terrifying. Yeah. Can I just say that's a little terrifying. I agree. <laughs> We're also learning how to act less and just like think and be more. Because I mean, that's what Melia told us. She was like, maybe just just keep your eyes on the page, considering none of this is memorized. And there's a lot of language. So just stay, stay there. And but, you know, I, I think it's sort of the same, isn't it? Like you walk into any theater and you go, oh, OK, so this is the space that I have to fill. You get to know the space, you do exercises, right. you, you do your whatever warm-ups on the stage, you run around the seats, you know, you like feel the space, and this is the same. In its in its uh, in its specificity, and you have a little relationship to the space. Yeah. You know, and you th this is our stage. Right. right. And you wouldn't you wouldn't overact. And it's funny because that, that first day, you know, I hadn't read the play before I got with you guys, because I was, I could tell two minutes into it, I was like, oh, I don't understand what's going on. So I said, I better, I better just wait and cold read it and see what happens. And then like literally at 3 p.m. on Monday, I was like, oh, so she's flirting with Estella to get her to say, meet me tonight so she can say, oh, that's what she's doing. Like literally did not get any of that. So, um, yeah, yeah, it was just a revelation. But um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, it's just, just the parameters are the same. You, you wouldn't, you know, if, if, you're, if you have like a, a, a small off-Broadway house, you're not going to, you know, act like this. It's just, you know, it's, it is, this is, this is our little stage. And it has its it has its requirements. The first day that I did the 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 courage to write a woman's wrongs, and I started screaming, I was like, "Yeah, that just didn't feel right." Because the up and the out on this stage is down and in, and that is the energy that works here. And you're like, "Oh, okay, that's cool." I mean, we all just, all we want to do is get get into a room and start blustering. I mean, that's that's just the, that's the best fun. We can't wait to go and do that again. But but this really is it, you know, it it needs a different kind of attention and it's very cool. I'm I'm beginning to like myself on camera. It's taken a lifetime, but it's it's something to learn. It's something to learn, and this has certainly taught me a lot about truth about language, about simplicity. It's always the same lessons you learn over and over and over again. Simple. It's better, always. Thanks. thanks yeah, Natasha. thanks. Um, let me, just because there's a, uh, the question has some uh, Melia questions in it, and I know that Melia only has a few more minutes. Um, Liz has a question, and she's raising her hand. So uh, she will ask it out loud, and I will once again allow you to talk because, you know. Um, so you should now be able to talk, Liz, um, if you want to ask your question. Are you there? Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. First of all, 
absolutely love, 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 love the reading. It was incredible. You guys were amazing. I loved your sides, the way you went into the screen. And just like Natasha was just saying now that, you know, it's not up and out. It was in, you know, down and in, right. and it was, that was beautifully done. Um, uh, and so this, my, my question is uh, to the director, Melia, but, uh, but Melia, but, but it could be to anyone uh, also who wants to join in, I mean, the actors. But I, I'm really curious, how did you go from, you had directed the, it as a reading in person, you were ready to, to, to present, I right? And then you had to switch to Zoom. What were some of the difficulties? Oh, um, well, I think it's, it's very much like what the, um, what the cast is saying in terms of the biggest challenge is that we're not breathing the same air and kind of playing with the same vocabulary that we do when we're in person. But just as some of the actors have said, I have been doing a bunch of Zoom things. This is what we're all, we're theater people, we like to work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it. Um, so I have, and here we go, internet difficulties. So I'm shutting off camera and hopefully you can still hear me. But I think the key has been to think about how to maximize the medium. Um, it's very much what Natasha's saying. You adjust your your performance for a certain space, and you sort of think, okay, what can we do on Zoom? Um, you know, Zoom does allow for some intimacy that you can't have other ways. There's a kind of immediacy of the actor and you. And um, I'm so sorry about my connection, folks. I'm glad this didn't happen during rehearsals. I really had an effortless connection through rehearsals. So I guess I should be grateful. And this is the punishment. You know? so it's good to add some edge of your seat drama to q &A, That's exactly. So, so I'll come and sure. go. But I mean, I think what's been exciting about Zoom theater, and I'm, I'm curious because I know Barbara's writing a book about Zoom theater, but is that we do all adjust to what vocabulary we have. Um, I also was able to see the previous Red Bull readings and so made some choices based on what I had seen previously and all the other Zoom work I had done and sort of thought about the scale of an actor's face against the background, um, how the squares work in relation to each other, what the backdrop, if there is a backdrop, should be, all these things. So in a way, you're just designing a reading in the same way you do when you think about where to place the music stands. Um, you're just placing the music stands, you know, as squares on Zoom. Um, I think where it, where I think it would be really challenging is if we had already envisioned this as a full production. I mean, we weren't going to do a full production. We were going to do a reading. So the loss of not doing a reading at music stands versus doing a reading on zoom there i think it's mostly a loss for the actors who get no audience response and are really acting in a vacuum from the director's point of view i mean look at their wonderful faces right now they can't see me and i'm enjoying seeing their beautiful faces again so um i, I think it's easier to be the director than it is to be the actor so I, I would sort of turn the question to all of you. And I, I think on that note, I am I am going to leave this wonderful room because the frustration of my false connections, I, I think are a little much. So I just want to say, um, I don't know if it was said before, um, I huge kudos to Red Bull Theater because the reason this reading worked as well as it did uh, was Nathan work, Nathan's work, Jesse's work, and the extraordinary staff, um, and how good you guys have all gotten at doing this for all of us. So just my last moment before I freeze again, I just want to thank Red Bull. As, as the rep, I will take all of the credit for everybody's work and just take it all. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, it means a lot. And I get you frozen in an applause. So it's perfect. <laughs> Just a nightmare. <laughs> On that note, I'm, I'm leaving this frozen world. But Bye. Barbara, Robin, thank you for this wonderful play. And you brilliant actors, I already miss you. So um, we'll find each other soon. Absolutely. Uh, let me ask, Lynn asked this really wonderful straight up question that I just haven't gotten to and I don't actually know the answer to. So let me just ask you real quick of Robin. Robin, um, 
what was Anna Caro's, um was she a contemporary of Shakespeare? Would she have known of Shakespeare? Where where did they fall chronologically? Sure, sure. So she's um a little bit later than than he is. I believe she, uh, this play is probably 16, 20, 1630s. So it was after Shakespeare would have died. So, but roughly contemporary. I would say in terms of her knowledge of the Elizabethan theater tradition in in London, um, these plays this play is really marked by Calderon, as Barbara mentioned earlier, and by a lot of the conventions of the Spanish Commedia. I I don't see in the text a strong a, a strong Shakespearean influence, and I would probably say that I don't I think most of these playwrights in Spain aren't looking to England for inspiration. They have all the inspiration they need already right there, right? And so, um, and so that's that's my take on that. What do you think, Barbara? Yeah, I I would just add to that that usually in the period it's going the other way around. It's hard, I think, for modern audiences to grasp because Shakespeare has been at the center of the theatrical world for so long. But in the period, in fact, you have people like Fletcher and Middleton and so many others actually looking to Spanish texts as the source. That's where the excitement is first. And then these theaters are sort of exploding in parallel, but Spain becomes the source for a lot of plots. Um, Fletcher in particular, I would say, is, is the one who's taking lots and lots of plots from Spain. Um, and so it's just surprising to us because we're used to thinking of the flows going in different in different directions um, today. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Natasha brilliantly typed out her answer to one of the other questions, but I do want to pose it to a couple of the actors we haven't heard from. Um, Anthony and Anita, um, what were your, I mean, other than your your star turns as as cowardly thieves at the beginning of the play, what were your favorite moments of the play, uh, both to be a part of and to to watch? What, what did you most enjoy about the experience? Oh my God, watch, watching Natasha and Alfredo go at it. My God, they were so brilliant, so beautiful. The ambiguity of this this love hate relationship was just uh, extraordinary to watch. This is the stuff of theater. It's vulnerable and it's beautiful, and everyone was doing that. And I think that speaks to Anna's work and to the translation as well. So for me, the unfolding of that relationship uh, between Don Juan and uh, Don Leonardo. Um, this this is going to be perhaps repet, uh, repetition for anyone who was at the UCLA talk back, but I I am so excited about the innuendos in this play because yes, they're very similar to maybe something Shakespeare would say, but to see a woman be just tearing apart the ideals of masculinity here, and and my favorite line is the um, the damp wood and two cold stones. And I just love even the idea of sword play and this idea that these this woman has to just really fit into this world of um, where her prose cannot penetrate. Um, and everything that she's pushing against, I feel like is inside of those innuendos, inside of the jokes that Anakaro comes up with. So it makes me really happy. You know what's so interesting is that, I, I mean, it's almost like, <laughs> like any of us women, like, or I mean, anyone, if you get really screwed over by a guy and then you're like, oh, I'm so, I feel so pissed off. I'm going to write a play and I'm going to dice the, <laughs> the guy in like every which way that I can. I mean, she really, she dissects him at, and, and this, and the hypocrisy of the talk of honor in the talk of being honorable. And you say you're honest but look at you. And she like at every point of the, of the argument of the hypocrisy, she really just slices and dices it to shreds and, and writes him responding to it, actually hearing it <laughs> and, and, and actually being affected by it, which I think is so, it's like, you know, that he's really uh, repentant because these ideals are, are right to have and it is a crime against them to be in this, to do these things and behave in this way. I mean, she's like, you know, she's writing, you know, her dream scenario of him to go, my God, the error of my ways. You know, it's, I wish I could write a play like that about a couple of people in my life. <laughs> yeah, boy. May, God, I like ask, um, may I ask, based on that, uh, for Barbara and Robin, 
how was it taking Spanish puns and innuendos and and these lists and and translating them for performance into English? Like, where was the loyalty versus oh, but that one's really funny versus like what was the balance like for you to go for for all of you who were translating it when you were dealing with these kinds of things? We try not to pass up any opportunity for a joke. <laughs> and particularly and particularly in, in a play like this where so much of the humor is her really puncturing Don Juan's sense of masculine honor. So, so that, um, again, to Anita's favorite line, that was not a direct translation. There was some sexual innuendo there. I think that idea of penetrating and the, that, that pun was there, but we actually took some license in saying, okay, this is funny in the Spanish and this is body in the Spanish and how do we, and how do we get these things ac across in the English? So jokes are a play where um, we're, we have a little bit more of a free hand because again, we're trying to serve an audience. If we, if we make some mythological reference joke that maybe a 17th century Spanish audience would have liked, but nobody here gets it, then, then we haven't done our job. So, so I think that's what I'd say on that. But the, the, the bodiness is interesting because it's a place where sort of two things overlap, the, the humor, right? And wanting to make sure that, that our translation is at least as funny as the original. And the originals are very funny, right? They're generally whenever, you know, we're in the workshop and someone says, is this here? I'm like, oh yes, that innuendo that you suspect is most definitely there and then some. Um, but it's the place where the, that innuendo um, overlaps with generally, I mean, the body, right? We, as translators, we, we, I think we, we had this insight early on, right? That if you're translating for performance, you want to make sure that the actor has as much access to language about the body as in the original, right? That we don't want to, because we're, because a metaphor doesn't translate perfectly or a pun doesn't translate perfectly, we don't want to lose that sense of the body in the text because that's so important, it seems to us, for when actors are building the character out of the language. I would also very quickly add to, uh, as far as the, the bodiness, um, I think sometimes people assume that because this is, you know, golden age Spain and the, the influence of the church, that it's going to be much more conservative than it is. But there is a lot of erotic stuff going on in these plays. And because you have these powerful women actors on stage, unlike in Shakespeare's England, then what you really get to do is, is expand on uh, the erotic possibilities of the theater. So there's a lot, a lot of that going on in these plays. Great. Thank you. Um, I, we, we have, oh no, we've got more people. People have jumped in. See, we got, we inspired them. Thank goodness. Um, let, let me just make sure. Sorry, y'all. It's just me back here behind the scenes. Um, these, I'm just going to read this one out loud and let's, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, what were, what was your, so we've heard the favorite jokes post-translation. What was your favorite joke, um, like pre-translation, that you were able, that you were most successful in transforming, in your own personal opinion? My, my favorite, personally, I think, because some of the spell in my section were were the lists. When Leonora is just, it just you fickle, you know, worthless, good for nothing, lying, cheating, ingrate, and she just goes at him, as I think Natasha was saying earlier. Um, that, and also trying to get the the graciosos, the humorous characters, their lines in there and their, and their awareness of their social position and sort of the way that they play with that, right? There's that wonderful line toward the beginning where Ribete says, oh, I see what this is. You're gonna be like Don Quixote and I'm Sancho and we have to go to the end and get beat up. And there's that sort of meta theatrical reflection on, on both, um, both social categories and status and representation and art. And so, so that, those two for me were the most fun. Great. Um... And let me ask. Nathaniel didn't word his as a question, but we're gonna give we're gonna give him some leeway here. Um, is it Barbara? Is Nathaniel correct that this is one of the few places? Kind of the question we talked about earlier with Don Juan, kind of getting his comeuppance from a woman in this way. But is this also one of the few where it ends happily? Or I sort of thought of Don Juan as kind of a comedic villain who often ends successfully, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, so you know, I I don't know about all the versions through the through the tradition on the Don Juan. I would have to say that a lot of the um, a lot of the plays that feature cads um, end in what is a happy ending for the period, but is nonetheless a little bit difficult for modern audiences to accept, right? Where where the idea that that somehow writing this wrong, even if it means that 
you end up with a man who has behaved in this way, that that is a, that is a socially desirable ending. And, you know, um, much as for the Elizabethan theater, right, there's a, there's a sense that the middles of the plays explore all kinds of liberatory possibilities. And sometimes even if the ending is, you know, a happy ending, uh, modern audiences are, are a little bit ambivalent about how that goes. Um, I'm thinking of an amazing play that is another of the ones we've translated called uh, Force of Habit, which traces two siblings who are brought up in the quote unquote wrong gender. And they there is a tremendous discussion of yeah, I like Natasha's face. Natasha, you can read it whenever you like. Um, there's there's a, a lot there about, you know, how do we end up in a particular gender identity and what does that mean? And what if someone wants to take that away from us? And, and the play ends in a fairly conservative ending where, you know, sort of through a more or less violent encounter with heterosexual love, you know, everyone is restored. Um, uh -huh. But does that undo everything that happens in the middle of the play, right? All that it gives us of, of a sense of possibility and where things might go. So, so I guess it's um, the, the problem of the conclusion is an interesting one, right? Like how, how do we weigh those conclusions versus what has transpired? I, I think for this play, right, the, the sense of all of that possibility of the relationship between Leonor slash Leonardo and Estela, um, which I think, you know, takes up so much of the play and then is suddenly gone. No. Well, we talked about that a little bit the last day, like with nobody else. And, you know, it was so, Helen, it was so beautiful to be, you know, Helen was just so luxurious with her, with her part. And it, it didn't, I mean, it took me understanding the plot and what she needed to get done um, in order to, to, to get the illusion over well enough. But it also, it's like, you know, the whole, the bring me a willow cabin at your gate. Yes, it's, it's totally that. It's like, these guys don't know how to love the way we deserve to be loved. None of them do. And this is what I would say to you. I would, I would, I would love like this. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know, was there anything else in the resolution with them at the end? Because it's just like, Hey, was that it? And then I'm like, yep, sorry. Yeah, I had to do it. Okay, move on. <laughs> like, it was so, like... I, th I think the strangeness of the way Estela has to propose to Fernando, um, and that is, it is unusual, right, for a woman yes. to take that step. Um, I think it calls attention to her to her sense of loss, right? To yes. Rather yes. Yes. I have to say, one of the things, there are many plays where, I mean, basically any time there is a cross-dressed woman on stage, all the women fall in love with her. That's just standard because those women are so much more appealing to the other women. It's very interesting, right? But but the, the women aren't always as kind, say, to their competitors. The disguised woman isn't always as kind to her competitors. And and I think in this play, there is a real sense that Leonardo, Leonardo is really very taken with Estela and that there's, there is for both of them a sense of loss when things go a different direction, right? And I, I think that's that's one of the things I would love to see, you know, worked out in a in in a in a production, right, with more time. And I think it's so it's so subtle, right? I mean, it, it, Estela is is like the shining light for everyone, right? Like this is why all the men are after her, right? And and Leonardo gets to play with that. Well, yeah, and I mean, it's but it's also funny because I think you know, again, it, I, I always have to be reminded by. I often have to be reminded by directors, but just like, you know, but, but what do you want? And what she wants is to completely win her so that she forgets Don Juan. That's what she wants. Well, she certainly wants that. But along the way, I think, is that the only thing she wants? I mean, you know, I think well, this, is, this is where there's a kind of space, right? For well, her. I mean, if, 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 you know, if I, if I need to go to the end of the earth, to avenge my to avenge the wrongs done me, you better believe it. We'd we'd go, probably go even further. You know what I mean? I'd I'd take it as far as I could. But but again, you're right that that's there's but there there was a and there still is for me a, a sort of like a fine line and like a, a like a filament between where I would really have killed Don Juan or where I would never have killed him. How much I mean what I'm saying to Estella and how much it is what I need to do in order to right the wrong 
you know, those, those lines would be really interesting to explore, you know, eventually. Well, I think, I think on that note, on the, uh, on the potential interest in doing it more eventually, um, which <laughs> I think is that. always a good open-ended way to end, I think that we should probably wrap up. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you, cast, for all of the work you did and all of the um, throwing yourself out there into that void and being and taking possession of it so well and creating such an incredibly entertaining evening and then joining us tonight. I really appreciate it from everybody at Red Bull back at you. It was really, really great. Um, thank you all. And Barbara and Robin, thank both of you and your whole group for make, literally making all this possible. It couldn't, couldn't have happened without you. Um, so thank you for your passion for this project throughout and for um, all of your help and for this wonderful thing you've added to uh, our classical canon, which is incredibly exciting. Speaking as a producer, it's extremely exciting to have a play like this added to the classical canon. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you all. Um, I'm now going to do some like end of evening, come watch our next thing stuff so you guys don't have to hang if you don't want. Um, but for those of you, the audience does have to hang and listen to me because we have lots of cool things coming up. Um, thank you once again for coming this evening. And Courage is still available to be watched until 7 o'clock tomorrow evening. So please do check it out if you haven't already or invite your uh, friends to do so. Also, if you've enjoyed tonight's programming, please check out on December 7th our remarkable podversation where I will sit down with uh, the wonderful director, Daniel Sullivan, to discuss the tent scene from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, uh, the ultimate um, proof that subtext does in fact exist in Shakespeare. Please do join us for that conversation. And um, thank you all again for tonight. 